So apologies, people. We had some, I think, some, um, some kind of software. Um, sometimes when we don't close uh, our meetings, people just come in. They're not people, actually. I think they're like hackers. Or, you know, there's this, uh, these robots that just make a lot of noise. But anyways, that's, we're not perturbed. We're still going to continue. I wanted to thank you, Dave, for being here. And yes, um, how did you become a relationship coach, Dave? Like, you know, that's not like, I mean, I, I, don't, I think there's always such an interesting story to why people do what they do and, and the background that led them there. So we're all ears. Yes. So a um, little combination of uh, uh, inspiration and desperation. Uh, I got divorced a long time ago, like 1999. And coming out of that, it was a, it was a shock. It wasn't something I was looking for. Um, and I realized coming out of that, that there were some things that I didn't really fully understand about relationships and I wanted to learn. So I got pulled into personal development. My first entree was one day I walked into my boss's office and he had um, the seven habits book, um, Stephen Covey sitting on his desk. And I just looked at it. I said, what's this? And he told me, oh, it's a really great book. You should check it out. You're welcome to borrow it. And I did. And I thought it was brilliant. I'd never really been presented with it like that it was like the wisdom of the universe in like two or three hundred pages and so i read it cover to cover and i thought it was brilliant and then that pulled me in and then from there just discovered other things i got tony robbins get the edge um learned a lot about that made a bunch of changes for me in my personal life and then you know discovered alison armstrong's work who is really um she helps women understand men a lot better it helped me understand myself a lot better too and wow. and understand women um, in turn so uh it's just basically you know this has been i don't know 20 plus 20 years now of doing personal development and i've been coaching uh professionally full-time for 12 years 12 years ago well, august 1st will be my 12th anniversary i absolutely love it um like i said i needed to learn for myself uh first uh because it didn't feel good um having those challenges in relationship and it was painful as you, anyone who's been divorced would know. Uh, so, and I didn't want it to happen again. And so luckily I was blessed to meet uh, another person in that community um, several years later. Now we've been married for coming up on six years and um, just it's changed my life in powerful and profound ways. And, you know, I think sort of, you know, we all come into this world, we have like a, a mission, um, didn't feel good when that divorce happened, but it literally was the thing that opened the door, helped me discover what I get to do. I loved my job before because I got to use creativity. I was a graphic designer and a writer in an ad agency, so I created TV and radio commercials. Uh, so I loved that aspect of it, but compared to what I do now, it's just no comparison. I'm still using the creativity that I absolutely love, but I'm connecting with people and you know, I'm able to change my life, so now I'm able to help other people change theirs as well. And it is uh, and just a total honor. Uh, and I love what I do every day. So um, one of the things that I, you know, you told me and Ellen a very beautiful story about how when your career started, there was actually some kind of huge economic crisis. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and it's like you had two careers, right? And then you, you could do coaching and then you had this other career. But mm -hmm. actually, you then made a, a com you had a conversation with God. Can you please tell us about it? Because it was so beautiful. And I think it's like something we can so learn from because I think Ellen and I also had this agreement with the divine was like, you're going to guide us. And I right. think it was so beautiful. When you told us we completely resonated with like, so often when we do this work, it's not about us. So can you please tell that story? Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah. Um, so as I said, August 1st, 2008 was my, I took a separation agreement from my company. I got paid uh, for my terms of service. I'd been there about nine years. They were doing buyouts. I took one of them and as the terms of the buyout, I could not go back to that company or any of the companies they owned. And they owned, it was a media company and they owned most of the print media in, in my market. I live in Baltimore area. And um, so Three months later, October of 2008 was the global financial collapse. And all of a sudden, coaching seemed like it might be possibly a bit of a, a luxury that maybe people didn't want, you know, maybe couldn't afford. And, you know, I just got to the point where 
you know, I was totally committed to what I was doing and I knew I was going to find a way. I had some false starts here and there. My very first client, I lost them very shortly after because of a misunderstanding that is, that got cleaned up months later and we're still dear friends now, but it was, uh, it was just one of those things where I think it, you know, things happen sometimes they want to test your metal. The universe tests you to say, okay, you sure you want this? And I had to, I sort of humbled out, but I also got really, like I burned the boats and I said, I'm not, I'm going to make this work. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I remember seeing a movie also with um, uh, Dr. Michael Beckwith and he, he's, he's basically in this movie, he was, felt like he was talking to me where he said, you know, um, God does not call the qualified, God qualifies the call. And so I kind of took that leap out. <laughs> Which movie and, was this? Um, it's a movie called The Moses Code. Oh, uh, oh that's and, we're going to watch that tomorrow. <laughs> it was good. It was basically, well, I don't want to ruin the, the movie for you, but it, it, was, it was good. And um, so coming out of that, I basically said, I, I'm, I burned the bullets. I'm going to make this, this work one way or another. And I said, and I humbled myself and I said, look, God, I'm talking conversations with God, another book that I've, I've read all three of those. And that was really powerful for me too. I said, look, I really believe that I'm kind of just a mouthpiece. I, I do this with humility. Uh, I'm honored to do it. And I said, look, God, if you want me to do this work, you've got to make it so I can. And I just took on the belief that I was connected and directed and protected, meaning I'm connected to the right people at the right time, um, directed and protected. If you want me to do this work, you've got to make it so I can. If I have to go back and get a job, I was a little bold. And I said, if I have to go back and get a job, you lose your mouthpiece. And, you know, so let's just have an understanding here. If you really want me to do this, you got to make it so I can. And that's been more than 12 years ago, or about 12 years ago now. And I'm blessed to say that I, I just never stopped. And I, I tell people, you know, I've been socially distancing before social distancing was cool. I get to work from wherever I am, meeting online with amazing people that I just love. And I get to celebrate their wins vicariously through them. Um, and I, I'm just blessed to do what I do. And, and it came down to just getting really clear on like what I'm doing and why and taking, you know, a little, little ego out of it. And just, um, you know, that's why I love what you all do too, about law of attraction. You know, if you're called to it, there's a reason, there's something in it for you. And, um, you know, it just it come with a, a, it's about being, wanting to serve and um, just loving people where they are, seeing what's great. You know, that's literally what I teach. I teach people how to, you know, I'm going to create more a legendary love for life. It's about, you know, um, bringing more love and peace and understanding in the world and bringing people mm -hmm. together. There's enough out there that divides us, you know, and now mm -hmm. I think like it's kind of gone crazy at like right, right about now, but um, the, before all this stuff happened, uh, the current world conditions, there was enough that brought us, pulled us apart. And so my, uh, my mission has always been to bring people together, create more understanding. So mm -hmm. I got my work cut out for me right now, I guess. To create a legendary law for life, right? That's yeah, the mission. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So one of the things that um, compelled me and Ellen to actually look at collaborating with you was um, that uh, we just sort of felt that you could create a lot of amazing online classes for people who really need it, like not so much, maybe not so much individual coaching, but more like education about uh, things. And uh, then we found out you have an amazing course ready to be presented to an audience. And one of the things that we explained to you was, yes, we are into law of attraction, but what we found in the law of attraction world is that, you know, you can know a lot of spiritual laws, but you can still not understand men, yes. you know? And you, you know, and then you ask all your girlfriends and all your spiritual gay friends, uh, you know, it's not going to help you, right? <laughs> so, and that's what I know about studying with Tony Robbins, but still when you're in the deep end in a relationship and you're being triggered and you're acting like a woman and he's acting like a man, you're like, still like, what? <laughs> so right. this is why Alan and I were really curious as to how can we collaborate with you and we're working on like something about, you know, promoting you towards the maybe more people who are more into law of attraction, but maybe know less about the masculine feminine aspects of relationship dynamics. So one of the things that I really want to know, Dave, is something you told me when I was working with you and I'm still working with you. Um, you said, Angelique, without the healing in a relationship, so because, you know, I was triggered in relationships, I had to heal in relationship. Without the healing and triggering in relationship, there is no relationship. And so I really want to ask you a question because Ellen and I, we talked about this. It's like, 
in the law of attraction world, <laughs> there, is a little, easy. <laughs> there is a little bit of a, a, some kind of myth that your soulmate is going to be super easy. Like, you know, it's like you have this, like, no more fights, no more triggers. It's like they fulfill you, they complete you. And it's like heaven on earth. And like, you just, you've done all the work and then you meet them and it's like happy ever after. But you told me, Angelique, without the triggers and the healing, there is no relationship. Right. Can you please tell the law of attraction crowd what this means? Right. So law of attraction, you know, is a spiritual law, but, you know, we're all subject to all kinds of different laws. There are laws of physics, right? Laws of physics are always right, whether you know it, like it, or aware of it, or, or, or not, you know, what goes up must come down. These are laws of physics. And it doesn't matter what you believe about them. No, that's not true. Or, or you know, yeah. flat earth or whatever. You can have all kinds of beliefs, but sometimes beliefs are just not um, equal to what is, right? So um, what are my beliefs? In my most recent book, I talk about the, you know, the purpose of relationships really is to, to heal your own uh, unresolved wounds. And, and most of the time, you don't even know what they are. Um, and I talk about it like this way, like, you know, like say you came out of a divorce or a breakup and you've lived by yourself for like, let's just pick a number, say five years. And you think, you know what, I'm in a really good place now. I'm, I'm feeling good after the divorce. I feel like I own myself again. I know myself. I'm in a good place. I think I'm ready to try this relationship again. And then you go out and you start dating someone. And then you realize, you know, I've mostly been by myself for five years and I didn't realize it until now, like I'm starting to date this person and now I start to understand where I hate when you leave a, you know, coffee ring on the table or if you leave the cap off the toothpaste or you do those little things that annoy you. And it's like, if there isn't an annoyance, if there isn't a, you know, something pushing against your consciousness to show you what it is that bothers you, um, it'll just lay there dormant, waiting to be awakened by someone to remind you and say, oh, by the way, you don't like this. And when you find out, oh, I don't like that, what if you drill down and you figure out what it is? You know, a lot of my work is based around understanding what is the unresolved wound. A lot of time it's about guilt or shame or abandonment or rejection. And those things get played out again and again and again. If there's no one there that can give the illusion of rejection, um, you're not going to necessarily know to work on it. So I like to think of it as, you know, you know, there's soulmates in what I term soul messengers. Sometimes a soul messenger is a person that comes into your life just to give you a message. And, you know, it's like if the, um, you know, I guess the courier comes to your door, FedEx or whoever it is, comes to your door to deliver a, pa a package. Um, do you want to get in an argument with them and, and fight them? Or do you want to just accept the message and say thank you and send them on their way? So I believe that people who come in your life to deliver messages say, oh, by the way, you should take a look at this rejection thing or this shame thing or this guilt thing or whatever it is, some kind not of unresolved good enough wound. thing. Not good yeah, enough not good enough thing. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, again, that's a shame thing or guilt. Mm -hmm. um, and so it all comes down, it, it basically is there to bring your attention to it. And, and the other point in my book, my book is called uh, Same Shit, Different Date. And it, it's based on that, that, that saying, same, same stuff, different day, meaning the same thing happens over and over again. But I talk about different date. So you date all these different um, distinct personalities and people who are totally different, but yet the same issues come up again and again. And so it, look, that's not happenstance. That's not an accident. That's not... Um, How many people have you coached, Dave? So you, you can speak from experience, right? Oh, like, I mean, gosh, hundreds, hundreds. And like you mentioned yeah. my, uh, my very satisfied client club, there's literally dozens of people who have been struggling in their relationships. And then I've actually helped them uh, and, and I started that, that group, you mentioned it. Uh, I used to get these texts on my phone. People would say, hey, guess what? I got engaged. And they'd send me a picture of this ring. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. And I kind of, like I said, celebrate vicariously through them. But it happened so often, I turned it into like a little, um, like an ad campaign, just to promote these people and say, these are in my very satisfied client club because they came, they did the work and they got the result. It is not about the ring. It is not about the marriage. You know, some of them had you know, children and whatnot. And I celebrate those things. I think they're awesome, but it, that's not the point. The point is they did the work and they got the reward. So that's why I turned it into, you know, that little thing. Cause why should I uh, be the only one that gets to enjoy that? I, it, it, beautiful things happen when you do the work. So I just wanted to, you know, celebrate them.
In many communities, we talk about doing the work. So in the Dr. Joe community, it would mean you do the meditations and, you know, yeah. like, you know, I do some other energy healing techniques, you know, so basically you'd have to like do a lot of energy release and awareness or Jungian analysis. This was a dream analysis or, you know, um, every, every teaching has a different interpretation of the work. Uh, what would you say in your, you know, in your experience that the people who are, who become very successful in relationships, like they crack the code of maybe healing themselves in relationship, in a, in a intimate partnership, what is it that they do that the people don't do that might be thinking they do the work, but they're not succeeding? What are, what are the characteristics between these two groups? You know, I'd say, but you give the example of like doing meditation, right? So meditation is an example or journaling, right? That That's an internal work, an internal processing. Yeah. I'm doing the same thing. So like, if you think of it this way, a lot of people are, um, their self-worth is dictated not by, you know, it, by who in they a reference out, yeah it's an external reference right so they're like oh this, my relationship is going really good we're happy that means i must be worthy i'm a good partner good things are happening right but as soon as that relationship runs into a hurdle or has a challenge all of a sudden their self-worth is kind of gone Plummets, so yeah. that's the thing that i help people do is to go in and you know know yourself and and figure out what those wounds are how to resolve them how to how to work on them and i've got a bunch of you know some of it's talking about it, some of it's journaling, some of it's exercises. There's all kinds of different modalities. And I mean, there's new ones coming and, you know, being developed all the time. Now we've got rapid eye movement and this and that. Uh, and we mentioned a bunch of other ones too. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even, um, what is it? Um, uh, uh, what's it called? The, um, like ayahuasca and medicine, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's all kinds of things that help people, you know, my, you know, my specialty is just helping people, you know, know themselves, love themselves and come to a relationship full. And even if you have a challenge with your partner, that doesn't necessarily reflect on you, you know, or it doesn't reflect on why you're less than, you know, when people know their value, it's just like anything. It's a, it's an exchange of value. If you, if you think you're not worth much, you're not going to get much. Right. So uh, it's really about from a humble place, knowing your value and, and just demonstrating it, know your value, show your value. And, and it works in both ways. Like, you know, we all want to be with someone who we look at and say, wow, look at, look at that person. I'm really lucky to be with them and vice versa. And so I think when we were both showing up in an empowered place, most of the little challenges kind of get, you know, pushed by the wayside there. They just don't really amount to much. But when there's two people who are really like, you know, pressing on these pressure points making each other feel less than or misunderstood or whatever it is you know that's where those those little issues come up and they kind of they create much more difficulty for people and it's it's that other stuff but you know like doing the the internal work and knowing who you are and you know understanding masculine and feminine how they work differently and you know again it's one of those more laws of physics they just are you know yeah. i talk about some generalities and understanding people and understanding there's outliers to every one of these principles, um, but they're still generally observable and they just are. So you can't, you know, you can't argue with, uh, you know, gravity. It's the law, you know, it is what it is. So. Yeah, yeah. So we actually contacted you because in our, in the coaching and therapy world, counseling world, we just heard that so many people were being triggered. I mean, just the, the act, the, the world's stage had a lot of things that triggered people into fear, uncertainty. Um, and then of course, relationships were also triggered. Some people, you know, for the first time in their life had to spend lots of time together. And some people, you know, their relationship were under stress because of, you know, whatever um, differences came out because there was so many changes happening. And, you know, um, so, that's why when, you know, Elle and I are trying to add value to our community, we, we're not going to talk about roses and, and, you know, honey or something. We're going to talk about things that really can shift people 
but really can help people wake up because I think this is a time of huge, uh, tremendous awakening for all of us and for ownership of how we are co-creating these painful relationship dynamics and how we all need to do our part. And so we really wanted to ask you like, Dave, could you please think about the most difficult, painful things that happen in relationships? And maybe even, you know, it doesn't have to be in this context, but have you seen things that are really um, like recurring themes that come up over and over again. And you gave us five things. So could you maybe walk right. us through it, but also not just walk us through it, but also maybe give us a bit of a rundown of how they can be resolved and also the difficulty in maybe sometimes how difficult it is for us to know it here, but to actually do it. <laughs> right, right. So thank you. Um, we'll just go through those one at a time. And um, so here's a great example of how external conditions frame the situation. So like even if you're in a relationship or if, if even if you're not in one too, like the loneliness and the isolation is incredibly triggering. And even if you're like, let's say you're, you're there with your partner, or there with your partner and your kids, right? Like there's gonna be additional stresses. In addition to being you know, isolated to only those people, there's the feeling, the knowing, I'm not free to go out and move about what I used, used to do. Something has been taken from me and something is missing. My life is not the same. I don't like that because it's, you know, it's, it's a, they're saying, it, you know, this was not my choice. Uh, it's unfair, it's unjust, it's mm -hmm. not right. And, and also people get, um, unplugged from their old, uh, let's see, like, like power sources, if you will, like, you know, going to work with their colleagues or going to the gym, or maybe it's watching their sports teams with their buddies, whatever you used to plug into, to either pass the time or to enjoy time. Again, if it's taken away and it's no longer an option, uh, people tend to struggle with that too. So again, it's a, a situation where when you're reconnected to who you are inside, like like someone said to me re recently, how are you doing with the lockdown? And I just looked at him and I said, I'm not locked down. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me like, well, what, what are you talking about? I was like, I just don't choose to look at it that way. Now, now here's the truth. I'm not going to a lot of places. I've been, you know, like I said, for 12 years, working from my home, connecting with people. So I connect with people all day long. So I'm getting that need filled. And I still go outside. I can't go to my gym, but I go walking every day for 30 to 60 minutes. So I get some sunshine. I go outside. I stay in outdoors areas. I haven't really gone shopping. If I go somewhere inside, that's different. And I hardly have. But I don't focus on I'm locked down. I'm precluded from doing that because, you know, personal development, where, fo where, where focus goes, energy flows. If I focus on lockdown, that literally could cause pain. I just focus on, I'm being smart. I'm making good choices. You know, I'm not going to need to fight what is, right? This is, again, this is what I'm saying. Don't fight what is, you know, move in the, you know, path of least resistance. It's like, I'm just making good choices for my personal health and contributing to other people and trying to keep other people and myself as safe as possible. And I'm still going about my daily life, living life every day. Now that brings me to like one of the first things. So, um, one of the first things we talked about the five differences. One of the first one you you kind of alluded to it earlier is understanding gender differences. Now again, these are based on generalities. There are um, lots there of are things that are contrary. exceptions. Yeah, yeah. There there are perceptions, and they're also they're they're generally observed in the species, right? So as a, as a generality, a generality as a rule, masculine tends to focus more on, you know, um, protecting and providing and pragmatic things. They take sort of big problems and make them small in order to solve them. And sometimes one of the downsides is they're not very in touch with their emotions because they navigate by logic and, and uh, solving problems, fixing things, right? Now, uh, contrary to that, vice versa, the feminine more navigates the world um, by, by emotion. So she's more in touch with her emotions, how things feel in her gut. Her uh, feminine intuition is literally about, it is your, um, your survival instinct to know, am I in fear? I'm in danger. Number one thing that navigates uh, 
feminine makes decisions by am I safe? Am I safe? Her gift is connection. Her gift is making, you know, relationships work. You know, she's got this intuition, like, are you okay? I don't know. You seem like something's going on there. She's very intuitive and she's very in touch with her gut instincts where men can sometimes be focused on a spreadsheet or a problem at work or something and, and can almost feel disconnected. Um, so these two um, humans uh, have very different ways of navigating the world, managing um, everything, you know, from what they see, what they don't see, what's important to what they don't value. And, so and because you just said women go look for safety and men yes. look for? Uh, men very rarely have a, a, a perception of unsafeness, right? Like they, like there's a great example that, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, in big, Date with Destiny, Tony does an example where he says, okay, um, let's ask a question. I want to demonstrate this for you. He says, ladies, in the, um, in the last six months, raise your hand if you've been in a situation that made you feel unsafe, you know, maybe walking in a, in a car park at night or a parking lot, you know, in the dark, being concerned for your personal safety. Raise your hand if you have felt uh, unsafe in some way in the last six months and, you know, 95% of the room raises their hands, right? And he goes, okay, how about in the last three months, in the last month, in the last week, in the last day? And it gradually goes down, but there's still a fair amount of people who even in the last 24 hours have felt their personal safety. And they said, okay, everybody put your hands down. Now watch this. Guys, same question. In the last six months, have you been in a situation where you felt like your personal safety was compromised? And a few people in six months, you know, definitely some will put their hands up, no doubt. Um, but it, it's almost the inverse ratio. Like the masculine doesn't necessarily perceive safety threats near as much because they tend to be more into fight or flight. And it, safety just isn't their overarching need. So they don't navigate the world that way. Now, this is not an indictment on anyone's behavior. There's not, nothing to say that one's better, one's worse. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just different. And they're both perfect and they're both beautiful. And, you know, but, but if you negate that, uh, argue it, um, don't want to see it. They, if the masculine you know, doesn't accept the safety just because they are not in that position, then they have a problem with women that real feel feel quite unsafe because of the maybe their behavior or them not understanding the need for safety right and again it's a gift to protect and provide like he, he wants to do that that's a that's a beautiful laudable goal and again it's how we work together beautifully i mean it's, it's partnership it's literal partnership you know like you know, one is focused on the emotional connection one is one is um protection and provision, right? So like, it's, it's a beautiful cooperative partnership. Those are beautiful things, you know, it's, one is no better than the other. They're both great, you know, so it's important. And I think it's just an understanding of that where, you know, Alison Armstrong is one of my uh, just true mentors in this. And her, her uh, overarching belief is what if no one's misbehaving? What if everyone is just doing exactly what they're here to do? And it's really all perfect. And rather than focus, you can even look, literally, you could focus on sameness, you could focus on difference, you could focus on the beauty of how they come together and what's great about the entire system. It, it really is just a great thing. Well, what you're actually saying is, is that because of the work of Alison Armstrong, and for those of you who don't know her, she actually did a lot of research, um, empirical research on men's behavior because she yeah. was suffering a lot. And she was like um, doing what a lot of the sexes do is they judged each other. So mm -hmm. like me, women judge men, men judge women. And because of the lack of understanding with Alison Armstrong did a lot of uh, courses, online courses that you can actually buy. And Dave, I think you, you trained with her. Uh, I did a couple of times and my wife was uh, when I, in her, um, I can't remember what she called it, but it was like her, her leadership group where they met with Allison, like every month they would get new content and they would have to go out and teach it and then bring back what they learned because Allison's always taking what she's learning from the material she's presenting and, and synthesizing it and, and creating new learnings based on it. So yeah. um, Yes, I, I love her. She's amazing. I went to her, she did a program called the hero's journey, which is catering to men. I don't mm -hmm. think she's done that in years. And, uh, and my wife and I also did her couples course, which was uh, really powerful just before we got married. So it was, wow, that's it was, really... it was incredibly uh, valuable and important. Didn't feel that way at the time, but it was, it was important <laughs> work.
<laughs> it's good that you went on your own journey. Yeah. Um, I know that in the Tony Robbins community, especially those who went to date with destiny and um, they say men really want freedom and women can sometimes feel very threatened by the freedom that men want. Can right. you, can you explain a bit, a bit more about that? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that one up. That's a, a great one. So yeah, I mean, if you think about it, if, if, there's an artfulness to this too. So this isn't just, this isn't bad news. If anyone said, "Oh, man wants freedom," that means he doesn't want me. That's not the way it works. Man is also looking for like what's best too, right? He wants even better than that. So the art is how does he have freedom and something better? So he has freedom within your relationship and you too. That's the best of all worlds, right? So like I make this case, you know, um, you know, since the beginning of time, every man that's ever gone off to war been willing to put himself in a position where he would literally die for something bigger than him. It was yeah. for the cause of freedom. He said, I will willingly give up my life because someone is telling me that my uh, my freedom is in jeopardy and there's just mm -hmm. something that stirs a man's soul and it only does an example in this Date with Destiny program um, from the movie, um, um, what is it? The, die the, Hard and a Brave Heart. The Scottish movie, Brave Heart, Brave Heart. Yeah, Not where, die hard. the scene where they run down the hill and they're um, overmatched by a much bigger British army. And this is back in 1500 Scotland. But there's this powerful, powerful moment where the men like feel a visceral meaning in their bodies of of literally being willing to die for something that you believe in so much. And like, I get chills just talking about it. It's, it's that powerful. And, and um, the women were actually, when they understood freedom in a new context, they weren't threatened by it. They were actually totally inspired by it and totally like actually um, uh, they found it really, really, really attractive. So there's just something about a man on a mission who has, there's something that's so important to him that he would literally die for it. It's inspiring to anyone who witnesses it. And it's really powerful, especially if you ladies are the one, the mission that he'd willingly die for if he had to. And hope he never has to also. Mm -hmm. But it's really powerful to have, to know yourself so well, um, to just unleash that, that aspect of the masculine. And I think, look, I'm, obviously there's not as many things that bring out that knowingness anymore, but that's a, it's one of the, maybe the most attractive things in the world when you see a man who just knows in his gut, in his chest, who he is, what he's meant for, he's on his mission and nothing is gonna get in the way. Um, but you know, I'm listening to this, I'm listening to this and I'm already feeling, you know, a sense of sadness in me because I know in my relationships, I would, I would, um, the sense of mission of a man to like save the world through his career, you know, mm. sometimes it can be perceived as abandonment, right? Or I'm not a priority. And this is, yes. again, this would bring us to, you know, one of the other di differences, which is like men and women have different um, spheres of influence that they're really connected to. And, and so, and women put relationship first, men put mission and, right career that's, first. That's the second one. That's about timing differences, right? So I think about it this way, like, again, we do this work at that event. Um, it's spheres of influence is where you are at this moment in time. And so there are de three different spheres of influence and we, you can figure out where you are. There is self, meaning my life is mostly about myself and what's important to me. Or second choice is my life is mostly about my relationships and who's closest to me. Or third, my life is really about my career and my mission and how I can go out there and, you know, um, and build and develop and, you know, carry out something. Now, the, the, the ironic part, again, here's another one of those differences where people misunderstand one another because they have a judgment about it. Most of the time, ladies will put relationships first because again they're the nurturers they're the connectors they're the ones who are like are you good are you good do you need anything can i get you something i'm getting up can i do that for you can i get that they're very conscious of everyone else's comfort and well-being and god love them that's beautiful um masculine by far number one especially in the let's say you know uh, 18 to 18 to 60 right oftentimes is going to be very much leaning towards career and mission because again their number one gift is the ability to protect and provide and if they aren't out there getting it done and you know getting their promotion and making money and they forget it, their identity they lose their identity they, 
They do. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, again, that's one of the reasons why sometimes men go in midlife crisis, crises, uh, because they've been working their whole life on something and they hit like some magic number or some period of time. And they say, wait a minute, I've been working my whole life for this. Is this what life is about? And it's really disconcerting. And Allison talks about it, it's like literally they go into a tunnel where they lose sight of everything outside of them and, and incredibly painful time uh, for men. And, and so again, it might look like, oh, they you know, because they're all about career and mission, they don't care. It's not true that they don't care. They do care, but that's an important part too. And it can't be dismissed or pushed under. Um, and also the other thing, the ladies oftentimes will put self last uh, yeah. because again, their life is all about giving and doing and looking after everyone's best interests. Again, beautiful, but also very self-defeating sometimes uh, for the ladies who feel just empty at the end of the day because they're giving, 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 and it's like a bank vault. If you're not filling it and filling it and filling it, there's nothing to give at some point, right? And then masculine is going to be career, mission, is number one and oftentimes self and so they can be self-oriented self-centered um now this does change later and now here's the good news too uh like i said if um if you know your own value and you show up in a way where you're not threatened or intimidated by a man who who is valuing career and mission if it doesn't take away from you and he can have career and mission and you too i mean he won the game it's the best of all worlds to him. And so, you know, most of the time a man would be like, well, I, you know, this is really important. And like, that's okay. I'm fine with that too. And like, and you're good with that too. And I can have you too. That's just a, a, a it's a beautiful situation to him. And a man will realize like, you know, this journey is way better with you on it with me. And so a lot of people who don't know their own value will make it a, you know, I want to be first kind of thing, rather than just acknowledging where people are and what are their, I guess, latent drivers, things that they don't even necessarily know that that's why they have to do it. They haven't necessarily processed it. But if there is a, a challenge, um, it just sort of gets in the way. So it's, a, again, this is a great way of understanding people's native drivers, what inspires and moves people and what makes them do the things they do. Um, when you understand that and you don't fight it or get in the way of it and you move with it, it's, it's beautiful. You know, you, you negate resistance and you go and you get pulled along. You know, it's like, why fight the river when you just go with it and you get pulled along gently and it's relaxing. To Easy. summarize it for people, because I, I, I can recognize so many of the mistakes that I made, which is women tend to give a lot of themselves and then they put relationship first. And because they're nurturers and connectors, we're always giving, giving, giving. And then when a man is in our life and we love him and he suddenly, he's just mission driven, career driven, that when he comes home, he wants to take care of himself. We women automatically feel super rejected and abandoned and like, oh, you know, you don't think relationship is important. I'm like last. But what Dave is saying is that Dave is actually telling us that um, when we have our own value in place, when we know that it's not personal what this man is doing, just men are driven. They just have other spheres of influence that they go for before a relationship because that's how they are wired. That's how they, they, they've been trained for like, I don't know, centuries. Then the woman can actually accept it and not make this, 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 this um, difference in spheres of influence a big, a big thing that is about her not being valued or loved or chosen or whatever. Yeah. I should have mentioned too, when I said career or mission, a mission can also include his woman taking care of her because one of his missions is to be a hero. Like again, literally all those men go off to war willing to die for something. Why? They want to be a hero. If you make a man your hero, he'll die for you. So like, again, that's the power of it. You can be part of the mission. You're an important part of the mission, but you have to add to the other mission, not take away. Does that make sense? You know, you've got to say, of course I support you. I love the fact that you're so good at your job. I, I want to support you. How can I, how can I help? How can I support you? And, and if you do that, like you're, you're a total addition, you're not pulling him away from what's important is like, wow, she gets me, she understands me. But you're, yeah. we're saying this as a matter of fact, but how many people already stumble at number one, the number one, which is a gender difference, and then number two, which is, you know, because we're talking about the two big, we, we started with five mm -hmm. relationship stressors, 
Right. We're, we're talking about it as a matter of fact, of course, this is how it works, but actually these things can take such a toll in a relationship, a woman wanting to feel safe and a man going for, you know, for, for freedom. And then right. the spheres of influence, a man going for career and mission and self and a woman going for relationship, just those two things can create a lot of stress in a relationship. Absolutely. And it goes back to like, I'm so glad that you all are here today and listening because this is about awareness because awareness it taps into beliefs. And, you know, maybe you've heard the phrase, as you believe, so you receive. So if you have a belief, now you have to go out into the world and look for evidence that supports your belief because everybody wants to be right. They want to feel like, oh, this is the way the world works. And I know this. And look, here, he is not into this because of this or, or, or vice versa. She is not this. Um, so they're literally trying to support the beliefs that they already have with, with references that, that fit those things. So, you know, again, if your belief is, well, you know, his job is more important than me. See, look, he's, he's there at work or he doesn't like, love me. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. And yeah. it's not true. This yeah. is not true. You know, that's yeah. the thing. If you, if you don't have that belief, you don't look for it. Or like I will say, you know, well, I believe that because he went to work, he doesn't love me. And it's like, oh, well, give me some examples of times you absolutely knew he loved you. Oh my gosh. Well, there was this and there was this and there was this and there was this. Okay, well, that's way more than the fact that he had to go to work today. Mm -hmm. So all those other times you knew he loved you. But again, it's when your outside world dictates your inside world. Whereas that's the beauty of coaching. It's like, have your inside world um, set that up right. And now you mm -hmm. set the game up to win. And so it's literally the difference between like, you know, scratching and clawing to make life happen the way you want it uh, versus being pulled to it. Because when your inside world is set up and you look for evidence that supports what you want, mm -hmm. you'll find that. But if you look for evidence that's contrary to what you want, you'll find that too. That's how genius we are. We will find whatever we look for. So I say look for good stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, it's easier said than done, right, Dave? Because, oh, of course. Um, Some people don't even know they're looking. They don't even know they have these, you know, um, uh, disempowering Painful beliefs. beliefs. Yeah, yeah. Pain painful interpretations of each other's behavior. Right. And yeah. that's, again, it's like uh, when we start to, you know, throw people under the bus and assume that people are misbehaving or doing something wrong. And nobody wants to be treated like they're, you know, doing something wrong or they're, again, because that triggers not enough. That triggers, you know, being told what to do and just all these things, you know, and it just gets to be painful. And it's two people who are not even really relating to one another. They're relating to um, what I believe you should be doing. And it's like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, when, what about my autonomy or your autonomy and showing up in this world in a way that lights you up and makes you feel good. If we're not both doing that, um, somebody's missing something. And mm -hmm. it's just not true that it's one or the other. Either you got to get everything your way or I get everything my way. That's a false, you know, a false uh, narrative. It's just not true. Both people can be getting everything they want or not necessarily everything, but they can be getting more than enough. Enough is the key word. Enough is what we're all looking for. We haven't even touched the, the next three ones, but would you say that um, it's actually very hard to actually get to this type of understanding without a third party that actually really knows this stuff? Because a lot of people, I know a lot of people that before they went to a divorce, they had counseling or coaching and it didn't yeah. work because somehow, you know, it, despite them loving each other, it would, the, the, the things were just like so escalated in a way, you know, like... Um, I think it's really, really helpful. Like for instance, like you could read about it, you can watch videos, you can go to events. And the thing is, if you, if you think about it, that is you're going to an event and one person is delivering a message that has to be generic enough to make sense and to keep the attention of like say 5,000 people or 50 people or 10 people. Um, so it's more generic. The, the beauty of working with a coach, I always say is, is like, it's the coach who's watching you in the action and saying, oh, when you swing that, you know, you want to, Bring your, bring your elbow up or adjust your stance or shift your weight or do this. It's the finer points um, because people get into it and they don't see themselves in action. And they, yeah. it's, it becomes rather than a concept, it's like this thing that you're doing that's getting in the way. It becomes way more individualized. So I think um, it's really important um, 
it's not the only way, but I just think it's really important, you know, because we don't always see our own stuff, but, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm talking about myself too, you know, when I'm talking to someone and I'll say something and they'll catch me and I'm like, Ooh, yeah, I never looked at it that way. I just think it's invaluable to have someone who, who gets you, who knows what you want, knows where you are and has a plan in mind to help you get there for your reasons, not theirs. I I just think that's a, an incredible gift, a beautiful thing that'll help you, um, you know, bypass resistance. Like it's, it's kind of aerodynamic. Like I said, it's rather than scraping and clawing to get something and you have no idea what you're doing wrong. Someone to say, Oh, well, here's that thing you're doing wrong. Let's just take care of that. And then you get pulled to what you want and it just becomes way less effort. So, I and think actually the things that we just discussed they're just like so when you know them you know because they you know they because i knew them on like because i studied it but actually right. when you're in a relationship they go out your your knowledge goes out of the window somehow you just basically right. react uh, from a lot of subconscious motives and it it's really interesting how you know little things like this can have such a big big um you know can lead to such a big painful rift between people yeah know? we haven't even because gone you go to, to a fight ones. flight or freeze at that point and you can't you yeah. know you're not you know logically in this thing you're not you can't see it uh if you're totally triggered and you're ready you're ready to fight about something then you can't see another way through and you're going to go with the fight or if you're going to freeze you know you're going to zip it and you're not going to say anything it's going to go on and on and on can gradually get worse or if you're going to fight you're going to run away you're going to break up you're going to end it you know, and it's like, wait a minute, there were other options. Fight, fight, or freeze are not the only options, but those are the ones we do under stress, you know. Fight, fight, and freeze are actually not actually helpful because as we know, you're going to continue the pattern, you know. Right. So even the spiritual teachers say don't leave a, a negative relationship because you bring yourself with you, you know. Right. Abraham. That's, all- that's my book too, The uh, Same yeah. Shift, Different Date. You'll just find another person triggering the exact same wound, but it'll look different. And that, that's the fascinating thing, because I literally have a, you know, assessment in the book where it says, you know, tell me about these things. And then we point out like this and this and this. Oh, my God, those are the same. And, and all these things, and they look different every single time. So you don't associate it. You know, it, it's powerful. Yeah. You know? I gotta give I, an example for mine. Like one of mine, the things that I needed to heal, why I do this work, too, is like I had an abandonment thing. So um, and mine started with being adopted at birth. You know, when I was three months old or I was adopted. That's a big and one. It's, yeah, it didn't seem like one, though, I, because it never bothered me. It was all matter of fact. And I, you know, it, you know, it wasn't really a thing, right? Didn't always feel celebrated in that family, right? Um, but, like, there was that. And then my, when my wife asked for a divorce, that was an abandonment. When I had challenges with my teenage daughter, as she age appropriately started to rebel and find her own way at 14. That seemed like an abandonment and rejection. And then, you know, just all these things again and again, you know, um, I didn't see them that way. But when you, when you pull them down, you're like, Oh my God, that's it. You know, so it's really Thank you powerful. For your honesty, Dave. Thank you for your honesty oh, yeah. and sincerity. And I love that. Um, we have three more to cover and you know I have to tell you just listening to you it's almost like Dave is talking to me personally by the way but all the mistakes that I've made (laughs) all the mistakes that I hopefully won't be making that's why I'm summarizing everything you're saying (laughs) Um, so what is the third one so the third one like we also have values differences we have to uh, like you know, plug into the fact that everybody has different values and what they think is most important. So like, like, for instance, you know, some people say, you know, their value is toughness. And that's sort of one of mine. So there's a time to be tough. And there's a time to be tender. If one person says, no, we got to be tough with our kid. And the one says, no, you're being too hard on, or like, or this vice versa, if they're in a disagreement, you know, or maybe one is about Here's another one. Uh, some people are like, get it done, get it done, get it done, get it done. A take action now person versus one who's like, well, wait a minute, I don't want to act too, I don't want to like do anything stupid here. Let me just think it through. Yeah. And the other person will look at him like, well, why aren't you doing anything? It's like, well, because I don't want to do anything stupid that I have to undo. Let me think about it. Now, which one's wrong? Neither's wrong. They're all perfectly good. But sometimes people have these interlocking and, and directly opposed values that are most important to them. 
Um, you know, and it's just important, like you get the uh, risk tolerance too. There's some people who are totally risk adverse, like I don't want to mess it up. Let me just, let me just take it easy. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to pretend I don't see it. And other people are like, hey, this is a problem. We got to go do it. Take action. I'm going to go quit my job tomorrow or something. And they'll just jump right into it. And the other one's like, are you crazy? No, I'm not crazy. Why aren't you supporting me? So again, it's just about how you see the world and understanding that like, a lot of times people will attract their opposite energy because again, it's a partnership and it completes them. And so if two That's people- That's why there's polarity. Exactly the right. The strongest polarity, polarity is with somebody attract. is very opposite to you. That's right. why, you know, that's why I always seem to attract men that are like my opposite. Yeah. They're very similar in terms of energy and how we think, but it's like some of these things, they come out, they're really opposite me. They're like, it's like, how did these two, people find each other <laughs> right but and again that's yeah. the thing where we make it wrong but it's actually perfect that's the way it is if you think about it like let's say two people get together and they're all about toughness 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 how do you what do you think it's going to be like when those two get in a fight you know they it's, all it's going to be attracted to each other i think every person from well possibly or it just might be so painful that they get divorced after you know a month because they can't take it because it's just too tough they're just there's too much animus between them Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just those things, and, and there are hundreds of values, hundreds of them. And so I've just given you three examples of, you know, in this hierarchy or um, mm -hmm. in this bandwidth of values, like how, just how they could be totally directly opposed. And, and it's really good information to know that. Like I said, you know, when you understand what drives someone, you start to, you don't have to make it wrong just because it's different. Like that's the beauty of the human experience. And like we have all kinds of different experiences. And if, you, if you're not making one another wrong and, and assassinating one another's character, like you always or you never, that kind of stuff. That's just ugh, really but just they, But the wisdom always comes in hindsight. Like for instance, you know, somebody right. could be very, very relaxed about, uh, let's say, canceling appointments. Mm -hmm. And the other one could be really like uh, rigid about it. Like, no, an appointment is an appointment. Like, why are you canceling me? You know, right. you're canceling me means you don't love me or you don't value me. You, you don't even care about my time. You know? That's what so abandoned people say. Or yes, rejected people I'm one say. of them. <laughs> yeah. so that, that's my the wound. meaning that they yeah. associate to it, right? Yeah, yeah. But again, I'm, I'm recovering from that too. So I recognize it. And I don't, I don't have that feeling. Like, so for instance... I literally talk to people all the time and my, I don't have a belief that I have to enroll every single person I talk to. I'm not expecting to. I just serve people and say, what do I love about this person? How can I connect? How can I give them a gift? If this is the only time I speak to them, how can I give them a gift that'll, you know, that they can take away and it'll make them make their lives better in some way. Now, if I live my life like that, where I just want to love people and I want to serve them, as you might expect, the people who decide that they want to work with me more, is probably remarkably higher than someone who is like, I gotta, gotta close them, gotta close them, gotta close them. I never think of that. I don't want to because I just think it's, uh, this is bad energy, right? I just, I just wanna serve people, love them where they are, see what's great in them, leave them better than I found them. Like that's, you know, my wife and I, we understand like that's our, our role in this world. Like she, um, we have an Airbnb that we rent out and, and she does real estate. Um, she, renovates houses sometimes flips them uh and our belief is whether it's people or places we come in we always leave it better than we found it like that's mm -hmm. our operating principle whether it's a house or a property or you know someone that we're coaching we just want to leave them better than we found them mm -hmm. so and that's doable and there's no beautiful. pressure beautiful Let's go to like value differences, you know, that, that alone. I mean, what would you say to couples like um, once they, you know, once they do arrive with you, like should they make a list of the values that where they clash or where they have clashed before with former partners? I'm just trying to be a bit like data, you know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to be like preempt on the type. You no, know, I love this type of stuff, like thinking about how we can make the world a better place because I think people keep making the same mistakes. Maybe there's a questionnaire that people should do if they get start, if they start to be serious with each other. It's like, you know what? I've had a lot of pain. I've made a lot of mistakes in my previous relationship. These are the things I'm still healing. Not that I'm broken, but because I, I really want to work on this with a partner that is 
also uh, acknowledges that he also has work to do or she also has work to do, maybe these are the things that we need to look at where there are potential, like more danger of friction, potential more right. me being triggered. And as long as you know it and I know it, then we have spoken it out before. I think that would be an amazing program to develop, Dave. Yeah. Based on so what I would say based on you know what you said there, it's like if you really want to figure out that, I mean, look, think about what your last five arguments. And this could be with your your significant other, it could be with your kid, right? You know, figure out like what was happening there. Remember the incident and now start to dissect what were the values. Like, you know, maybe it's more of a control versus autonomy, right? So like you're trying to get your kid to get his shoes on and get out the door and you're like, get your shoes on, get your shoes on, get your shoes on. And he's like, but I want to watch my shoe. And, and so it's a, there's a dynamic there, right? One person wants autonomy and choices. The other person wants, you know, a bit of a more authoritarian, do it now, do it now kind of thing. So then you understand like, okay, now I see where that is and, and you can adjust within that. But again, you got to, you know, you know seeing a, a child wanting to finish a show, not necessarily wrong. Maybe there's other strategies for that. Maybe there's prepping them. Maybe there's, you know, saying, all right, we're going to need to leave or I'm going to tape that show or we're going to watch that show later. We're not able to do it because we have to leave now, right? There's other strategies that will work better for you. But yeah, the, the best way to look at it is figure out what are your last five arguments where there's smoke, there's probably fire. So figure out what was, what was the value underneath? What did you want? What did they want? And where did they conflict? They're guaranteed there's usually something that you yeah. can identify. Yeah. We, we come at number four and number five is the juicy one. Number four is also a big one where people get, you know, they misinterpret each other's behavior a lot. Right. So that's what we're talking about. Your preferences and references is what I call them, or, uh, you know, wounds that are either in common or that are um, contrary. Right. So um, like, for instance, we were talking about, you know, when I, when I was talking about abandonment and how it used to be a thing for me. And then I realized I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. I did some work around it. Now it doesn't bother me near as much. Most people are not aware of that. They have not done that work. They have no idea. So if you say, um, you know, if like, if you say to your kid, you know, if you're not, you're not ready in five minutes, I'm leaving without you. And then you actually do it in some ways. Now you've just really triggered something that could be a recurring issue for them. Um, so it's just, it's about understanding that, People's pat. Oh, here's the other thing too. Like a lot of these uh, references, a child's entire expectation of the world is formed pretty much in their first seven years. So by the time they're in like second grade, they know everything that they need to know about the world. Uh, but an adult is still zero to seven in terms of their immediate triggers, right? That's what you're saying. Right. So looking at like, you know, is it a, is it a beautiful world where people are caring and nurturing and supportive? Or is it a world where people don't matter? Or you're on your own. It's kind of dog eat dog kind of thing. These are fundamental decisions like learning how to share, learning how to say please and thank you. All these things, those, these are the things that will set you up for a lifetime or, you know, or, or not, or cause you pain for a lifetime if you didn't get these, you know, sort of fundamentals and beliefs where people are, you know, celebrated but there's also um you know there's boundaries and, and boundaries are effectively um, put out there and maintained right it's all important and like there's so some people like if if you're raising a child and you have really difficult time you know like you you kind of laugh at them and you think they're cute and they could be cute and get out of it they learn that for a lifetime that no one will apply a boundary if i just act cute and funny you know a ton of comedians out there who operated on that principle, right? And they're now making their living doing that. Um, and so it's like these, these things that um, create lifelong preferences or experiences or wounds in some case too, it depends on um, you know, the way you look at it. So by seven, a lot of that is set. And so it's really important to understand like other people's histories and what's important to them, what's not important, what do they value? That kind of thing. Did you do you have a question, Ellen? I thought I saw your hand up. Okay. So can you maybe talk about um, because when we were having this pre-discussion, you were talking about rejection and abandonment, shame and guilt, jealousy, and some of the big wounds that come up, and that you know when a couple have uh, problems, 
these things it's like i think you were the one that told me it's like people are not talking to each other their wounds are talking to each other mm -hmm. so the wounded child in them or the wounded person in them is talking to the other wounded person and that's not the person they fell in love with they're like who is this person you know it's like right. wow this is a different person and then really that's and if that is not navigated well the relationship will deteriorate and really people then start to um what is it they, they start to engineer really painful painful memories for each other and, right. and you know and a lot of um if they don't understand what is going on that it's not you know malintent it's not negative intent it's just right. two people really hurting and then do, do protecting themselves like the way you explain to me how i protect myself how I keep on protecting myself and then how my partners then keep protecting themselves and how I shouldn't even like interpret their behavior as negative intent. It's just like two people trying to protect themselves. If you know that, then you're right. not going to be coming from this, oh, men are bastards. You know, I can't trust men, blah, blah, blah. Ellen and I, just before we went on, we were saying that there's so much pain in relationships. And Ellen, you said something really interesting. It made me laugh, but it's not, it's not a funny thing. What I remember, what I remember you say, say was like, you know, we have a few things that, that hurt us in, in one relationship. And then we take it to the second one mm -hmm. and then the third one. And then we stack up. It's compounding. Like, yeah, this huge amount make of you pain. Rich or miserable. <laughs> yeah, and then we basically go like into the next relationship, and then it's just and, and and we were just like laughing about it. It's like it's so painful. There's right. so much pain, and like and and because we both know that everybody wants an amazing relationship, but like how many marriages actually last? How many relationships actually last? Right. You know, you gave a great example there. So why don't we just, we'll use that one. So you said something about jealousy and we hadn't talked about that yet. So like, think of it this way. So you meet this brand new person and they've just met you and they are totally enamored with you and you have 100% of their attention. They're pursuing or they're, you're connecting, you're meeting all the time. You've got this really passionate, you know, toward pursuit, right? That is 100% uh, reciprocal. Both people are interested in one another and they get together, but pulling de rejection, um, excuse me, um, uh, jealousy down. So there's got it, there's probably some sort of a, uh, a wound about rejection. So if we, if we play this out, let's say in the beginning you get together and it's really passionate, 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 and then something happens, life happens. And let's say, you know, fast forward like six months, a year, five years, 10 years, right? And if you came together because there was this torrid, passionate um, a pursuit, and then all of a sudden, like, something else becomes an issue. Someone has a, you know, another health challenge or a career thing or something is going on that pulls their attention away from the constant pursuit of you and your biggest wound is rejection or abandonment. And all of a sudden you see the partner who once pursued you 100% gave it everything, everything, everything. And all of a sudden they're paying attention to someone else. There's a great example of how if that is your belief, you know, we, we have this expectation where we're going to meet someone and they're going to be, you know, we don't, you know, we don't think that people change over time, you know, that's the one constant is change, you know, stop dyeing your hair for a while, find out about change or, you know, all kinds of cosmetic surgery and things like that. Those things change. We expect that. But people also change, too, in terms of values and change of uh, in terms of, you know, when a need gets satiated, right? They don't pursue it quite as hard maybe but there are constantly changes over to, like i gave you an example before like a man that goes in the tunnel a uh, midlife crisis like his values are going to totally change and it looks like oh my god what happened who is this man i don't even know this man anymore mm -hmm. he's in the tunnel it's a difficult period for him he's going to get out on the other side of it we don't know what that's going to look like now but you can enhance your value by the way you support him while he's in it or you could say you know go buy your Corvette, I'm out of here, or, or, or whatever, or, you know, decide what you want to do based on your meaning, you know, one of the most powerful things that you, you could ask is what else could this mean, you know, just because a man's in a sort of a midlife crisis thing, you know, he's you buying a Corvette. You let your wound define the meaning. Right, exactly. And that's right. where we go immediately. Yes. Yeah. And you'll think, you'll personalize it, you'll make it about you. Well, yeah. now you're not being 
the man I thought I married. It's like, well, you're not even in touch with his pain about he's lit, you know, he's been working his entire life and now all of a sudden he's been climbing this ladder and one day he gets to the, almost to the top of the ladder and he looks down and he's like, whose ladder is this? What the hell am I climbing? What am I doing up here? Why am I doing this? Whose idea was this? I'm only doing, I got this job because, you know, my dad told me I should do it or, you know, whatever. And he starts to realize like, what, what am I doing here? And you're only focused on your pain because he's not paying attention to you. You know, this is just an example of, you know, how that works. And it, it's like, that's the beauty of it. When we can start to get out of our life, our world and into someone else's, not right or wrong or different, just saying, well, what, what, what does that mean to you? What's going on for you? Help me understand it. And they might not be able to understand it. Most people, you know, in the midst, in right, right in the middle of a midlife crisis, they're just as frustrated and, and you know, upset about it themselves, believe me. Oh. But, you know, it takes understanding to be able to enter their world and say, all right, what's going on? Talk to me about it. Let me, let me figure out where you are and let's see if we can get you on the other side. But I think the big issue is, you know, Tony, Tony in the strategic intervention coaching training t uh, talks about the levels of love, level one, level two, level three, level four. And a lot of couples, they, you know, level three is hard because the, I know in the coaching, when we were coaching, we're like, wow, am I actually on level three? So level one is baby love, right. meaning you are like a child. And a lot of us, you know, actually regress back to that type of type of love. It's like, oh, it's all about me. I'm the little child. And especially when our wounds are triggered, we go there. Level two is when we are uh, bartering. It's like, I give you this love and then you give me this love. But if you give me this love, then I'll give you this love. But you have to go first. Yeah. And so uh, according to Tony, level one and level two love, uh, basically those, those two levels never, ever they don't last. They just don't work out. So the only way that we can actually um, have a chance to have a passionate, good relationship, harmonious and life fulfilling, satisfying relationship is go to level three. And level three is where you actually, your cup is full and you give. It's about giving. It's not about getting. But how hard is it to go to level three? You know, when I was coaching people, a lot of people, the only thing I had to coach them on is level one, level two, level three. It's like, where are you? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm in level one or level two. It's just that's what that was all they needed because I, I explained to them when you're not in level three, you're going to create a lot of suffering. And the thing is, but I myself find myself going back to level one or level two, you know, and then level four, I could never understand level four. I was like, level four is like the love of Jesus and Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. Like, am I ever going to get there? Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I will, but uh, it, in, with a couple in a relationship, I think it's pretty damn hard to go to level four. Right. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah. I mean, I mean, the ultimate too is when you, when you have that level of love that says your needs are my needs. Again, presupposition is you can't be focused on what you're getting outside of it. You have to have a, you know, a rich internal life where you know who you are, you know what you're, you know, if someone's upset with you, not going to get you out of your lane. If, you know, if someone's overjoyed with you, you're not going to lose sight of who you are, right? It's like just grounded. You know who you are because you've done your work. You know, when you're not going to get pushed out of bounds by a little bit of resistance. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of love where, you, where you're able to give that kind of love. You know, your needs are my needs kind of thing. That, that's fairly selfless and fairly um, resistant to any external forces or, or factors that are going on outside of you because you're focusing your attention, you know, so it's... How many of these people exist, uh, Dave? How many of these couples exist? They're out there, you know, I think that's the importance of, you know, look, uh, look at how many people could have been anywhere else today and they're spending this time here learning about that. So I'm going to say whoever's here, whoever watches this, this preview or this, uh, when it's replay. recorded, the replay, um, that's how many there are because you're all on the right track because you're paying attention. Your values say, hey, I could be doing anything today, but I'm going to be here listening to this guy I don't even know because I want to take my life to another level or I want something more, you know? So yeah. these people and many, many more who didn't know about it yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, but, there's plenty of them out there. You can you focus on what, what, where focus goes, energy flows. If you focus on how many don't know it, it's going to feel like there aren't many. If you focus on, look at all these people who are getting it. Now you're in the right direction yeah. and you find your tribe and people are yeah. connected to their tribe. 
you know, they'll, they'll feel like, wow, we're a fit. We have the same, we have similar mm-hmm. values. We get one another. We're doing the same work. We're committed, you know, mm-hmm. these are the important things. So I'm hearing a few things. I don't know whether you hear it, Ellen, but I'm hearing over and over again that it's very much about um, a person knowing their inner value. But when we haven't like, let's say we've been avoiding healing our wound because we've just, a lot of people I see that and I was one of them, just focus on career, focus on wealth because you know who's going to pay the bills, right? So, and I, I, I work in super ambitious environments, you know, with people are always driving us, you know, you can achieve everything. So we go for the masculine masculine route which is like not relationship but we just go for the career and then you end up in a relationship and then boom your boobs come up like this and then you suddenly have to do the work you suddenly have to do the work like oh my god that wound i never looked at it i knew i had it but it wasn't important because i it wasn't triggered because i was not in a relationship but then when you get in a relationship it gets triggered and then you have to do the self-valuation work i mean the wound and the self-love, they really go hand in hand, right? Yeah. And, and Self, like, self-valuation. Also, um, I'm sorry, what did you say? Last part? The wound and the self-love slash self-valuation because the wound makes us go back to a place where somebody has to give us something. What I'm hearing you say is once you have your inner center, you fill yourself up, you know your value, you're healing the wound and then you can never come from that really uh, distorted place of making it all about you, with, you know, because a lot of the, the, the pain that comes up is like not being able to see that the partner has, you know, has a good intention. He, they have right. their perspective. They have their own experience. They have their other drivers because they are different sex, for instance. Right. And, and I think the other thing too is people like find their, um, find their passion or what they're meant to do uh, by figuring out, well, what am I good at? What do I, what am I really good at? Like you said, you know, your belief is, you know, you're around other achievers and striver drivers essentially. Right. So that feels like home to you. And like, so maybe someone else is a, like a total uh, nurturer. Right. And like, maybe they want to do daycare. They're not going to probably make that kind of money because in today's culture, it's often not as valued as much as a corporate day trader, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. And and so you ask the question, well, which one's more valuable? I don't know. If I'm trying to find a place for my kid that I love more than anything, I'm going to be kind of more biased in terms of that. Again, it's, it's so seeing everyone's innate value that they bring to the table. You know, there is no good, bad, and different. It's, it's all great. Everyone comes together and we're, we're doing, you know, what we love and, and what makes the world a better place, ideally, hopefully. Um, so it's just understanding that people are working in their zone of uh, strength. Like they're mm-hmm. finding what, what, what appeals to them. You know, like I got into advertising because creativity is my number one gift, you know, art and, mm-hmm. and words and TV and radio commercials. But to come back to the area of relationship, Mm -hmm. we are very much confronted with the fact that if we don't work on our self-value, which is independent of what um, a romantic partner or society gives us, it's going to be really tough to bridge this 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 thing of the the childhood conditioning maybe it's not even wounding it's just because we're conditioned in such a way that we expect love to be given in a certain way or we expect people to behave in a certain way so that we either feel safe or we either feel that we're not controlled for instance or right. you know not giving away too much of our autonomy if you're a man right or like again the other example is like you know if someone's if if you don't know who you are internally and someone says to you you know you're really selfish and it's like ah oh, that crushes me because i don't want to see myself as selfish or whatever whatever the word is bitchy whatever whatever it doesn't matter but it's yeah. like you know one of the things you know john Martini talks about it all the time too is in quantum physics you kind of um equilibrate those feelings like well where am i selfish yeah i've occasionally been selfish and that's okay you again it's a balance there are times when it's okay to be self-oriented because if you're not that means you know you a total pushover and people walk all over you all the time so again it's how do we get to that place where you know your value but you also don't let people just 
beat you down to nothing because you're afraid of ever making a choice that benefits self. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a good time, a good place to be to occasionally make choices that work for you and that, you know, because then, you know, the other example where we say it's all, you know, I always have to give, 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 give. And then one day you wake up empty because you've given, given, given. I would say to them, it's probably good to be a little bit selfish again. How do you balance it? You know, and be able to go in and say, yeah, maybe I was a little unfair there. I should probably do more here. Or no, I give all the time. This is probably the time where I can be, you know, self-regulated a little bit. Look, mm -hmm. I think having that conversation inside your own head and managing, you know, who you are and what you're doing, I think that's invaluable. You know, there's times when, yeah, we might be a little selfish. Or there's times when we're not self-oriented enough. Mm -hmm. And you unless you are really clear on where you are and you can own your stuff, like, I think you'll struggle with that. You, you're at the risk of other people portraying you a certain way um, when it's not true and they're only doing it to manipulate you because plenty of those folks out there too who would manipulate you in order to get their own needs met. Well, hopefully our, our group of people are not going to go there. And, uh, they could have been anywhere yeah. else today and they're here, so they're on the right track. Yeah. So number five, I think you even wrote a book about it. Number five. A book I did create or a, a, a program. Product. I, uh, I made a CD about it. So mm -hmm. it's about love language or strategies, love strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding it's about like a, people need different things in order to feel loved or close. You know, it's yes. uh, Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. My product is a CD. And a funny story, I, because creativity is my thing, I used to talk about it and I would just forget one or two of them. And I'm like, oh, and then there's this one, this one. So what I did is I created an acronym. Where I call it the hug and kiss hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so I actually put seven in there. There's two that um, Dr. Chapman didn't talk about, um, but it's about understanding like some people are all about what I call human touch, connection, loving, touching, kissing, squeezing, holding hands, like physical kinesthetic contact. And some people are about unselfish service. Wow, you, that's so beautiful. Thank you for doing that for me. Thank you for getting that. Thank you, you know, serving in some way, doing a favor for someone. That's, a, that's another way that people feel loved. Um, there's gifts. People, some people love to get gifts. Other people like, you didn't have to do that. You wasted your money. I, I don't even want that. Like mm -hmm. it's all about our personal valuation mm -hmm. on what is that worth and what does that mean to me, right? And again, it's not a negative thing. It's just people have a wiring. Um, and if you think that's wrong or you think, oh my gosh, well, I can never do anything right. It's because you maybe don't understand their, their love language or their love strategy. You know, some people it's um, kind words and affirmation, compliments. Mm -hmm. You know, some it's about feeling like they're the most important priority. That's the I in there that Gary Chapman doesn't talk about. They just want to know that, you know, that person is really oriented to them and really cares. And, and you can totally trust that if something happens, they'll be there, right? Like that's an important uh, need for some people. Um, and then there's special moments, quality time. You know, some people like, it doesn't matter what we're doing as long as we get together and we got that one-on-one -on -one time. Mm -hmm. And then some people are about soul connection where that's about just, a deep, deep knowing of one another, like you're practically finishing with another sentences where there's like a, um, like a, a sexual, sensual coming together, two people become one. You know, those are, those are other important things. And, and so if you have a, you know, a human touch person and uh, you have a gifts and presence person, those are very different. If mm -hmm. you're trying to like give someone a hug that would much rather have a gift, you're not understanding what they need. You're not understanding their model of the world and, and vice versa. If you try to give a, you know, the opposite, try to give a hug to someone who just wants a gift, right? Vice versa. Um, it's difficult because you're not, you don't have the same currency. You don't have the same value. And again, it's just another way we misunderstand people. We say, oh, you're just greedy. All you want is gifts or you, oh, I can never do enough for you because I haven't, you know, I said, thank you four times yesterday, but you forgot because mm -hmm. I didn't say it nine times today, right? Mm -hmm. um, we just make assumptions and it's a bit of a, a character assassination assassination, yeah. based, based on our experiences, what we want versus what, they're, uh, what we're getting and not getting yeah. and our beliefs around it. So those are the five areas where I think creates the most misunderstanding. 
So I know you have a, a relationship rescue program because when I went to your website, um, oh, yeah. and I know when you know when we coach couples, it's really difficult because very often couples um, they want you to take their side or something, and I know from experience that you don't go there. You actually I get my referee shirt, my black and white stripes. Yeah, you're super fair, and you're super like you know you call people out. Like you would, you would call me out if lovingly. I if I said something. No, no, you said it very lovingly, and I would watch the recording, and I was like, whoa, you know, you did it very skillfully. Um, but what I wanted to ask is like the relationship rescue, because I know some of my friends, they try to rescue their relationships, going to, you know, relationship coaches. Like, what would you say, you know, because we now know the five areas and, you know, we know how sometimes these things take a longer time. What is in your experience, if people are in real crisis and they would like to, they need to work with a coach or you know with like really see how whether they're gonna split you know like a big decision or what they want to heal it how much time should they take because i don't know the ins and outs of your relationship rescue program right. um, is it like would you say three months six months would you say you know oh, no, that's a that's an intensive so we, we so a little background story on that one so that's called my uh really it's an in-home program it's a rescue where my, my I told you my wife does this work too but not every day so like literally we're going to put ourselves into someone's home for a weekend sort of watch them in progress one day figure out wow. where where they were getting stuck and then individually and coach them together figure out, okay here's the thing here's the workaround here's the fix and then work with them for just a, over a weekend and then support them with coaching after it so it's an in her in home experiential like deep dive and again if you think about it like you know there's couples with you know kids mortgages been married a long time you know, they're literally sitting there risking, you know, losing half of everything they have, right? Half of everything they built mm -hmm. up. You know, there there might be a need for a resource like that to have someone come in and just say, all right, look, this is, we're going to give ourselves this gift. We're going to try to figure this out um, mm -hmm. and, and get in there and, and see if we can work it out. Because most of those five things, any one of those five things that we've talked about today, that any one of them is enough to totally blow up a relationship if okay. you're not aware of it. Yeah. You know? And, and a lot of times it's a combination of two, three, four, five, even five of them. So by having this insight and being in there and, and sort of watching them in action, noticing, you know, how they talk to one another, what, what's the underlying issue, what's the presenting issue. Like a lot of times the presenting issue, like the, he did this or she did that really has nothing to do with the real issue right it's it's several mm -hmm. steps below that like a more foundational thing so it just gives us an opportunity to go in there and even if it doesn't ultimately work and and i believe anyone two people want it to work they can most of the time figure out yes, how to make it work absolutely. totally believe that both of them are on the same page uh but that being said i think sometimes like there are certainly situations where people you know, like I said earlier, people meet at the, you know, the 18 years old and they think they're going to be, you know, never changing. And then one day they wake up at, you know, 50 years old and they're like, I don't even know who this person is. I had no, I wasn't given a single thought to who this person would be, you know, 20 or 30 years later. And then sometimes people just do grow apart and maybe for their own ultimate highest and best good, you know, maybe they do want to, you know, find a new partner. That's a long time. To be with someone but it, again if you at least you know part and with appreciation mm -hmm. and you know yeah. rather than just animosity and hatred right because that's yeah. toxic you don't yeah. want to you know if you take the bricks of that uh relationship that ended really badly and you take bitterness and 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 resentment and you go try to build a new relationship with someone else that's probably not a good place to be either so again our, our pledge is we see where you are see what we can do and, and always leave people better than we found them but you know we're willing to take that time out of our lives because again it's what we it's what we do it's what we love you know mm. love and peace and understanding we want to create more of that in the world so you know it's, we think it's worth offering that for people who might want to avail themselves of it mm. before they just you know feel like there's no other answer and they just get a divorce and then one day they wake up and realize maybe that they didn't have to yeah 
Um, in our community, you know, Ellen and I, so we see in the spiritual world, there's a lot of women doing the work and a lot of them are single and a lot, you know, and so, um, they would probably flock to a lot of these law of attraction manifest the man type of stuff. Um, and I myself believe that you also need to do the grounded work, which is like this type of, you know, just really nitty gritty things that we just like we have to th understand hormones. We have to understand masculine and we have to understand female hormones even. Right. Um, and, 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 um, evolution of how we wanted safety more and men want freedom more and they want to die for their country more than they want a relationship because that's how they're valued. That's how they achieve significance. Um, um, but, um, there's also this thing about this world of online dating and, you know, people just be, it's so easy to find a new partner, like whatever the illusion of partners, right? Because, you know, you can literally swipe left and right and have 10 dates in a week. Right. Where would you say, is it wise to actually, you know, like you've been dating for a while and then suddenly you, you come up some of these hurdles, where would you say, should people really say, you know, this is not going to work together? Or would you say at least find out this and this, if you really love each other, there's always a way. I mean, what, what are your experiences there? Um, um, because I, you know, it's sometimes such a minefield, like a, a landmine, you know, it's like to, to navigate. And mine, minefield? Minefield. Uh, what is the word? <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> It's, it's tricky. Uh, it's, it's complex be. because, yeah, because if there's an illusion because there, there's an illusion of like, you know, I can just, you know, there's somebody better out there. Not, not people are always looking for somebody else instead right. of looking at themselves. At like, how are they creating this? How are they bringing out these type of characteristics in their, the people that they think they love or that they want to build a relationship with? So what would you say is common sense? Like if two people meet and they, they are together for a while, they get triggered. And then what would you say are, would be the, the right next steps in order to find out what actually are we really compatible or not? Let me take a half step back. When you're talking about like online dating years, one of the beautiful things about online dating is that it opens up the field of possibility uh, to all these people that otherwise, you know, many years ago, you might not have otherwise met. I think that's great. The downside of that is sometimes it sort of makes people seem like a commodity, you know, like, you know, swipe, yeah. swipe, swipe, swipe. And that's about the amount of effort that you put into it. Um, again, my personal belief is you go and meet people what, and you ask the question, what do I really love about this person? What do I appreciate? What do I acknowledge? What do I notice? What do I respect about them? And again, even if it, they're not your forever lover that you're going to spend the rest of your life with, you can still leave, you leave them better than you found them by, by honoring them for who they are and appreciating the opportunity to cross paths and getting to know them. Most people, because online dating has commoditized it in such a way, um, they're out there like, what's wrong with this one? What's wrong with this one? No, nah, I don't know. I don't like his look. I don't like, I don't like, uh, I don't like goatees or I don't like, I don't like, I don't like blue eyes or I don't like brown eyes. I don't like green, whatever. You know, just make up these little biases or prejudices, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so they don't really connect. They don't ask the question, what's great about this person? I think if you're gonna date, that's that's a great way to get started. When, when I look for what you appreciate, what's great. And that doesn't mean you're supposed to settle with them. I don't think that at all. Um, and again, the other thing I say is, um, I did this exercise with a group coaching that I was doing. I said, you know, how many people, I asked people how many they dated and how many versus how many they got into like a long-term relationship that I defined as like, let's say six months uh, or longer or lived with or married them. And so I, I canvassed the group and basically what I came down and said, so um, let's say, let's just round it off and say 40 people over the course of their life, they're going to go out on 40 dates with different people, you know, with one to live to with them and married them. Right. And so it was basically like, and like four of them would be either long-term or uh, like married. Like say they got married once, dated one, lived with one, dated one for six months. And so out of 40, that was basically, that's like a 10% is going to go deeper than like a few dates. Mm -hmm. And so I said, so that means 90% of the people that you meet are never meant to be your forever person. 
And and so, but most people are like, oh, I got to make this work. I got to make this work. I got to make this work. I don't think that. I think you just go and you meet and see what's great in that person. And you don't leave until you've learned, like, what I, the assignment I give my clients is, you're, you know, I call it my second date formula. You got to go and find five things you like about them, respect about them, appreciate them, notice about them, and reflect it back. So you leave them better than you found them. Mm-hmm. And I think it revolutionizes dating because it doesn't, people go on a date and they feel like that's terrible like you know guys will come away and say you know say you know another bought another dinner went nowhere women like say i got dressed up for nothing or whatever but people come and they have these experiences and they take little wounds with them you know um where we just don't um the person we're spending that time with don't feel like they were really totally seen or appreciated or acknowledged and that's unfortunate i think um, so as people go on dates to get their needs met, it's like, oh, I, I hope this person is my soulmate or whatever that means. They have to light me up, you know. Um, and some of them just want something to do for an evening, right? And again, that's, but you don't know that when you're swiping left and right, you know, and some people are not really into it. Or some people are, you know, don't even believe that they're ever going to find someone. So like people bring all levels of... Um, beliefs, woundings, and things like that to the table. And like, I think the one thing that, that brings out the best in people is appreciation, looking mm-hmm. for what's great about them. And, mm-hmm. you know, even if you say at the end of the night, like, I really like, I admire that you do this. And I think that's great. I really respect a man who does this or a woman who has done that. That's awesome. I really love what you're doing. And they say, well, would you like to go out again? And like, well, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I feel a connection on that level, but I think you're an incredible person and I know you're going to find the one for you. And to be honest about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you just leave people, like I said, better than you found them. If you say, well, you know what? That's really nice. You might say something to them that they've never assumed was a strength. You're like, you know, I really admire the fact that you, you know, served your country. Or I, re- I love the fact that you volunteer in your community. Or I love the fact that, you know, you started a business and you're an entrepreneur or I love the fact that you physical fitness is such a value for you or whatever it is just appreciating someone because everyone has multiple things they bring to the table that are really remarkable that are awesome yeah, yeah. doesn't mean you agree with everything or want it for a lifetime but there's still things you can admire so I think that's a that's a beautiful way because you know the re, the the other realization is that dating can sometimes be really defeating. It can feel really bad. If you're going out on a date and you're thinking, oh, this might be the one, this might be the one, you get there and you're like, ah, and you're just sitting there. No connection, I'm not, yeah, they're boring, whatever. Can I get out of here? Like that's destructive to two people's souls at least, you know? It's really, it's tough. Not even to talk about the other scenarios where people, they seduce uh, one another or they, they seduce a person and they just ghost them or they just leave them, you know, just n- not being ready. They, right. Yeah. So. Um, that can happen too. Again, it's people yeah. trying to meet their needs as they understand them. So but that's, yeah. that's why I try to, you know, teach and bring, you know, um, this more conscious dating. You know, getting people to show up on dates, you know, in a way maybe they've never showed up before, you know, just knowing their values so that no matter what they, they show up in a great way, in a way that they're really proud of themselves at the end of the night. You know, it might not be your, your forever love that you met, but you leave knowing like, wow, I really like the way I showed up. And I think that is huge. That's what I really remember from when I started coaching with you. It's like you just, uh, the first session was so confronting. It was all about my defeat, the, the strategies that I had, the wounds that I had that led me to where I was. So that was like a real eye opener. It was like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this year after year after year, thinking I would get a different result. But every time push came to shove, I would use the same strategies because of the wounding that I had, that I still hadn't healed yet. And because I didn't have to heal it because I would just avoid relationship, right? Right. And then when I was ready to work on it, of course, you know, I was, I had to work, I had to work on it because they were triggered in my, in my relationship. And, and so many people don't know that they're self-sabotaging. And so yeah. like, if you're going out there and you like, let's say you got a wall up as just as an example, there are millions of them. Um, then 
they'll think, oh, well, men play or players are jerks or they're not into me or they weren't serious. This is like, well, but they never met the best of you because you showed up on a date with your wall up because you fundamentally don't really trust men. And so is it their fault that they didn't really want to see you again or they didn't, you know, decide right then and there that they want to spend the rest of their life with you if they didn't meet the best of you? Like, mm -hmm. whose fault is that? Who's, and it's not about fault, but it's like, whose responsibility is it to show up mm -hmm. on a date um, and demonstrate your highest and best, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's ours. That's the way we need to show up and, and in our lives. You know, we need to show up in a good way because we're meeting people all the time. You don't just meet people when you're swiping left or right. You know, sometimes you meet someone while you're, you know, filling your car with petrol or, you know, mm -hmm. you know, at the grocery, at the market, you know, you meet people all kinds of different ways and places, mm -hmm. but it's about how you show up. So. I love this, Dave. Ellen, do you have other questions in the chat? I haven't been able to read no, it. No questions in the chat. There's one sharing from Sineva about the, um freedom aspect that she's been craving freedom but still wanted the safety and she was traveling a lot and people were questioning their relationship but they both uh, do things by themselves and give each other space and freedom but then they meet up home and that's where the heart is so they've never experienced or been scared of uh, unfaithfulness so she says thank you for sharing that because it uh, confirmed her uh, feelings for uh, safety and freedom Mm -hmm. yeah and sometimes they seem totally differently but they they coexist together yeah. and it's again it's, uh, enough right it's how do we get it now so i want to feel free but i also want some safety so how do we figure out how do we negotiate a way where both partners get enough and that flexibility to um, i was reading it like being able to travel separately but then when they come together there's just no question about you know how they feel about one another so um, thank you so much for that question. That's a great, um, a great example of the concept we were talking about. And Susan says she has a question. Um, so the masculine and the feminine is that gender based and do you also work on gay relationships? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for that. Yes. Um, yeah. So again, this is about, um, this is not about a sex or it's about a, an essence too. So Usually in a, in a same-sex relationship, there are certain characteristics that um, it's often based on polarity, meaning one, one partner might embody more of one essence than the other in order to have a true attraction. So there were, like, it doesn't matter the gender, two women might, one might be a little bit more into a masculine energy. So um, yeah, it's not based on sex it's based on energy um but yes i do work on uh gay relationships as well um so great question thank you and apologize for not making that more clear thank you okay those are the questions i see so far i don't think we have any others awesome it's pretty clear thank you. um is there, are there any words of wisdom that you would like to maybe give us? Um, because I think there's actually here, there's uh, quite a few um, married people, long time married people as well. And there are some singles. Um, and so, um, so yeah. And are, are there things that you would um, like, like to say to us, uh, maybe some words of wisdom? Yeah, I think, um, so a couple of things. One, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to do your own internal work, to know your value, know, what you're, know and show your value, what you're bringing to the table. That's very confronting for uh, some people um, to think about it that way. And, and I think when you start to do some of this work, like the, the five things we talked about, like they're, they're game changers in terms of, when you stop looking at someone who's misbehaving and you look at people who give people the benefit of the doubt and understand oh, that. I know it because I, I you know, yeah. everything that you spoke about, I would come from my wound and interpret it as it's personal. It's they don't love me. Yeah. yeah. And that literally is the, that's the entree to depression. Like depression is it's personal, it's pervasive and it's permanent, meaning it's yeah. always going to be there and it's never going to change. And this is something that's wrong with me. And that will lead a person into a depression. 
Yeah. You know, those three Ps. Uh, and, and it's not. The thing is, here's the, I can tell you that all human behavior starts with a good intent. Even the worst, worst things that humans do starts with a good intent. Mm-hmm. You know, and like I give you an example, like someone can, you know, lose their temper and say, just shut up. Like it, the good intent that it started with was peace. They wanted peace or they wanted something. It, I'm not saying the, their, the way they went about it was good, but it started with a good intent. You know, so understanding that there's always a reason why people do what they do. And it always starts with a good intent, Mm -hmm. even when it's really indefensible and not really good behavior. Yeah, yeah. Natalie, I know Natalie is one of my friends, one of my muses. She runs a huge community called She Dares uh, with a lot of beautiful Mm -hmm. women, a lot of beautiful women coaches and um, entrepreneurs and uh, business owners. Uh, Natalie, you've been listening. I know you, you also host your own uh, women's circles. Uh, you host huge events just for women. You've been listening here, listening to us. Are there any questions you might have? Because I know you do, you do this a lot more with more inner women directed. This is more about, you know, I, I, um, so just, just, just wondering whether you have questions coming from your, your connection with so many women from different walks of life. We can't hear you. Oh, what's going on? It is, you are, you are unmuted. Uh, we, we are not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, so I've got to put myself a uh, speaker. Okay, I'm just outside with the cat, by the way. Here's my view in Amsterdam. <laughs> nice. Um, so, I know. Hi, thank you for a wonderful um, uh, session. Um, I I think there are so many different angles, uh, but one of the things is definitely that women women take a hit when, or the expectation to 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 give and to be pleasing. And I did a gender uh, a gender workshop, and she said globally the thing is women are taught to please. That's the number one denominator globally and what what you describe is that we empty ourselves and then we blame the other one for being empty and that one we have to correct ourselves and the thing is there's such conflicting values you have to be this that and the other um and we we need to we need to take the time to figure it out for ourselves but uh but there's too many there's too many things being thrown at everybody. So unless it becomes a real priority for you, you're not going to fix that problem. Yeah. Um, or so much pain because it's about uh, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Getting um, leverage on yourself and having a, a big enough reason why you've got to change it. The, yeah. That's right. Right. If you, if you're, if you're in a, a relationship and you're a six out of 10, you stay. And if, if it goes down to four, it becomes unbearable. So then you take action. Um, and what I, what I really enjoy with this conversation is that you, you, you look at it from all the different angles and the, the throwaway aspect of the online dating is very painful. I was myself in a 17 year long relationship. And then I went out with a guy who was exactly the same as my husband. I just left. And then I did a year of work to, cle- to literally to clear my own energy my own heart space because my heart had hardened uh and when i did that through a lot of meditation my teacher kept saying to me your heart will know when you meet the right person and uh and i did i met somebody ridiculously at the speed dating and it's been the last two years have been the best of my adult life but I did the work. I really, I said, I will prefer to be alone than to be with the wrong partner this time. And I had somebody like you guiding me through what were the things that I automatically did. And it, it changed my life. So I think that's the key. If you're not able to, to basically figure this one out by yourself, then get help because it's such a complex matrix. Yes. Um, but there is, I truly believe there is someone for everyone. And, uh, and I salute you for doing the work too. And, and I love your example too about understanding that like, 
we you um, experience was we you you're so wired to please that you give and give and give and then realize you're empty, and but then you're up you're you're upset at someone because they took when you gave and gave and gave. <laughs> and it's like, well, <laughs> what, what yeah, are you, you know, that's owning it. You know, not as, a, not as a, a shame, but to say, you have a role in fixing this, you know. Yeah. So good for you. Way to, way to go. Join the work. Well, you know, that's as you say, people who are showing up here are doing the work, right? You do Absolutely. the work. And you keep doing the work. Those are my people. I love people. I love working with personal development people, especially. <laughs> with junkies. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Really fascinating. My pleasure. Thank you. The thing is, what I would say is a lot of people can read books and you can even study as a coach. And, I, and I've and i seen coaches getting divorced as well or, you know, really struggling in relationships. And it's because knowing is not the same as doing it. There's a big difference between knowing it and doing it. That's why in the appreciation game where Ellen and I, we, we, we work with the universal laws, people know it all. They've read the books, they've read all the books, they've gone to all the seminars, but we teach them day by day to keep up a practice of applying certain things, such as such as simple as appreciation, as simple as looking at the structure of your thoughts. Are they toxic or are they actually about appreciation? Because if it's not about appreciation, you're having a toxic thought and then with every toxic thought, you're going to kill a situation. But you know how difficult is it when we are triggered? And so a lot of our players they need to overcome their automatic reactions, which are very often about their filter of, you know, this is, I'm not being respected. I'm not enough. People are not loving me. People are abandoning me. They're criticizing me. You know, it just goes on and on and on. And it's actually really, um, really, really fascinating how we, we never, we have to keep on doing the work to actually stay awake, stay awake and, and, and to, to, to catch ourselves, right? But I love, I love Natalie's uh, testimonial of doing the work and I'm definitely doing the work because I intend to, 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 to win. I'm a winner. I've been telling everybody here because we've been doing a series of victim, victim saboteur. And the, of course the opposite of victim is Victor. And today I was on a boat trip for a friend's birthday and actually we went past the ship was called Victor or I made a picture for Daniel who we interviewed and Ellen. I was like, another sign that we're victors. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, you here listening to this, being serious about it, we're going to um, brainstorm with Dave what the, what the divine wants us to do together with Dave. But you can imagine how important this work is. Dave sent us a 24-week program that he has on the shelf that I think could be a year-long program. <laughs> And we want to collaborate with him to actually bring it to the audiences, to the, to the worlds that we, we are in, because there's so many women that, that would benefit from this. And uh, to just be reminded, because every module I read of what you described, Dave, is, is like, it's, it's, not, it's not like a luxury. It's not like, oh, I can just forget about it. Actually, if you don't know about it, it's going to come and bite you in the ass or something, you know? Uh, and, and I think it's at least if we're, even if it's not applying it, but you know it, you might, you might be able to think, oh, wait a minute, men, men are just different. Sorry, sorry, honey. You know, men don't, I shouldn't be telling you what to do when you're driving. You know, like this, you have all these funny Alison Armstrong anecdotes about women telling their men how to drive and what type of reactions they get, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and we just tell him because, and because we're like that, we don't really think about it. But for a man, it's like, oh, like the most horrible thing. But, well, that's a great uh, example of where feminine's number one need is to stay safe. Masculine doesn't necessarily have an mm -hmm. appreciation for safety. So how do you think they're going to drive differently? You know, it's going to be very different. Great example. Yes. So, I think we had a question from Victoria as well. I um, Victoria. Doesn't... I, I saw you think about abandoned relationships with clients if they cancel or your belief is that they don't love you or they don't like you or something. Victoria, um, of course it's true. Your wound is always right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She knows me. She's in the appreciation game. <laughs> right. 
So again, what I said earlier is like my my belief is different, and so my experience is different. I don't. Maybe it's my belief. Maybe it's my experience. I don't know. But my belief is like. Remember, I think I said this earlier. When I meet with people, I just want to give them value. I want to meet them where they are. I want to figure out what do I love about this person. Give them something of value that even if they don't work with me, I'm going to totally change their life in just one conversation. And they're going to take something with them, and I'm going to leave them better than I found them. And so I don't have a um, like. There's no strings attached in what I'm going to give. So they're free to go. Now here's the cool thing. Most of the time, they think, "Wow." I got so much out of that. I think I do want to work with you. So my question for you, Victoria, is who would you be if you didn't have that belief that people could abandon you? My belief is some, if you just teach people, maybe it's not the right time. Like, here's a great example. I met Angelique 10 years ago. I didn't work with her. But 10 years later, when she was ready, she came back. So that's a great example. Like, I wasn't trying to close you or like, sign you up or or you know and i don't you were just adding value in all these facebook groups you know all these people right. you didn't even know whether they were your clients they were just asking i would oh, say yeah. very dumb questions sometimes and you would still still give value you know uh, even if they, they would never turn into your clients but you were right. like you know, were you were basically i think uh cultivating honing your skill just giving from uh because i think you know, universal laws, those of you who know on law of attraction, what you give is what you receive. So when you come from, I'm giving to get, you're, you're, create, you're, you're, you're sending out lack to the universe. Whereas if you're, if you're vibrating, I'm creating, and the more I give, the, the right people will come back. I just don't know who it will be. That is the right attitude, you know? It, you just keep on giving because you know it must come back tenfold or, or more but you don't know which, which channel is going to come from because the universal supply is so humongous. We can never second guess where it's going to come from. Right. Yeah. And, like, and when I'm answering those questions in that group, and they're not my clients, they're just people, they're just good people who have things that have happened or it's challenging them. So I think about it, it's like, uh, you know, Native Americans, Indians say you can never enter across a river at the same place twice because the river is constantly moving. So I just answer a question from, you know, Jenny or Susan, whatever the name is, right? Uh, I answer a question for that person, but I know in a group of 8,000 people, uh, there's probably 2,000 of them that have had a very similar issue or a belief or a situation. Mm -hmm. So I don't look at it as just answering a question for one person. I just, you know, I, I see the, um, the beautiful worth in that person and I just want to serve them. And, you know, I figure that I'm, I'm creating massive value for a lot of people. So that's my focus. And even if someone has to cancel, I don't, I, I don't, you know, believe that that has a reflection on me. I just think people have busy lives. Sometimes they have other things and responsibilities that conflict with that. And even if someone, like, let's say, comes away from a conversation with me and they think I'm full of crap, they don't buy anything. Then there's something wrong with them, Dave, if they think you're full of crap. Well, I I literally don't resist it. I just say, oh, um, I maybe it's not the right time. Maybe I'm not the right coach. That's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm totally fine with that. Like I'm not. Again, I've done the work internally. Like I know I'm pretty good, and I get results for a lot of people in this line of work. So just because one person, their wounds think that I don't, I'm not very good at what I do. That doesn't confront me. It doesn't make me feel bad or be angry or sad or feel like I'm not good enough. So. Victoria, I hope that helps you. But you uh, did a lot of work to be to, to be here, right? It didn't come naturally. Oh, absolutely. Our, de our default is to care and to interpret things through our conditioning, which is very often our, you know, our filtered bias about why people don't like us, don't love us, don't buy from us, don't want right. to pay us, etc. Yeah. So that is, I would almost say the default because that's the story we 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 think is true, but then when we do the personal development work, we have to dismantle these beliefs one by one by ourselves. Right. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about you, Victoria, I don't even know you yet, but what I know because you asked the question is like, you just have a, a big heart and you care so much about what people think and you just want to serve at such a deep level. Victoria is one of our model students. Victoria doesn't know anything about law of attraction, I bet, but when she joined, she, she was one of the master manifestors. And we, we basically had to rewrite our ideal client because of her. 
we thought our <laughs> ideal clients were people who had done work for hundreds of years. Victoria is like a newbie who didn't know anything about law of attraction, wow. but because of her discipline, started manifesting, became very psychic, started knowing. Basically, she started getting what we call downloads. She trusted it and she started manifesting all these other things. So that would literally be the reason why you were having that experience. Like you didn't know you, you had the wrong avatar, the person that you're looking to do, but you're the wrong ideal client. Yeah, so yeah, Ellen and I. experienced it is to get really clear on, on your ideal client and who you're supposed to be serving so that you're not wasting time trying to convince someone of your value when it's readily apparent when you know exactly who your ideal client is. So good for you. Like you, she's inspired the whole group. That's fantastic. That's why you're getting that, um, you know, that, uh, what's the word? The, um, you're getting the resistance, you know, because you're, work, you're trying to convince the wrong people. Uh, working with you needs no convincing. No one needs to be, have their arm twisted. You know, it just takes- Absolutely, take- Victoria. Well, there was, um, hi, hello, everyone. Uh, the, thank you for this um, call. And Dave, you were spot on, actually. I used to, my, <clears throat> My aim used to be to save the world and when client would come to me, I would be like, oh my God, I don't care what it takes. I need to learn how to help them. I'm in health and well-being. So I would want to be everyone, a physio, an osteopath, a surgeon, and I realized it's impossible and I'll get really upset to the point that if I couldn't help a client, I would feel depressed and uh, I had to, I realized I had to refer clients because I can't do everything. And um, yes, I used to think if client cancels, even rebooks or just, I would take so personally, I would be feeling like, I, you know, like, like they left me and uh, it's like I've been left by myself in this huge right. entire world, just me, poor me, you know, this kind of thoughts. <laughs> but uh, it's changing. And what you said, you are a second person who's telling me this, that I'm, I was attracting such a wrong kind of clients. And they would not get me because I have, I wanted to give so much, but they wanted so little. Right. And uh, then I was feeling like, you know, they were just falling. Since I started to do lots of work, uh, they just start falling apart. And then new people would start to come in, people who I really enjoy working with. And uh, I just feel finally for such, after so many years that I can actually give so much that I have and I can give. And it feels really fulfilling. It's not like I give one person, I can give 10 I'm 10 times more, 100 times more, and people really actually enjoy it and they benefit from it. And it comes back to me in a sense of such a fulfillment. So I, th- yes, you are absolutely spot on with this. So thank you so much, Dave. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you, Ellen and Angelique and everyone who's here. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Susan, you wrote down a question. Um, can you explain what your question is? I think there's something about believing that there is somebody out there for you. Okay, I'll un- unmute myself. That's easier. Oh, it's just um, hi, hi. It's just that I was so touched um, when oh, by all of this, but especially also in the end when you said there's a partner for everybody, because I've been wanting a partner for twenty years, maybe you know, and oh. I always say I want it, but I don't really act on it, and I'm very happy. To be, I'm, I'm very happy by myself, but some, I would love to meet my soulmate. And, um, but deep down, I have this belief that it's not, there's nobody there for me. So I was just thinking, where do I start working on that with, with what you offer? So my first thought, I don't know if we have time for this right now. Um, I would love to invite you to do a, a call and we could just chat about that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's somewhere in there where you, somewhere along the line, you've got that belief that there might not be someone for me. And I don't know where that belief came from, but when we can isolate that and we'll start to figure out because that belief dictates your actions. You know, it's, it's actions, belief, potential results. So if, if you have a belief that uh, what's the use, uh, there's no one out there for me anyway, you're not, you're going to take a limited action and you're going to take a limited, you know, the belief action, you're going to get the results and, and you're just, you're going to get delayed be, and you won't get there because your fundamental belief is what's the use. It's not going to mm-hmm. happen anyway. So you won't get out there and you meet people. You won't be open and vulnerable when you meet people. You won't be in a good place. You'll be kind of pulled back. You'll be 
you know, reticent or reluctant when you meet people. And so they won't, they won't meet the best of you. We've already seen the best of you here in like the last two minutes. Like you, that was open and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes to meet someone is open and vulnerable. But because we've created the safe container right here, because we're just answering questions and we're talking about seeing the greatness in people and loving people and understanding and not making up stories about what we believe about them. Like you felt comfortable to be able to ask that question here because you felt no one here is gonna judge you or think any less of you or criticize your choices or you know that, that kind of thing. So because you had a, a safe space here, you were able to ask that question. We got to see the best of you. We actually see you smiling and lighting up and being open and vulnerable. And we all think you're great. Yeah. So we all know that there's someone out there for you. But it would take a change in your belief to change your action, to change your habits, to change your results. So I will, make, a, I will make a call with you. That so Ka Karen is also asking, how can we do a session with you? So Dave, his website is called Legendary Law for Life. And so you can find it on, you, um, on Facebook, Legendary Law for Life. We tagged him, Dave Elliott. And when you go to his profile, it will say founder of Legendary Law for Life. So that is where you can book a session in his calendar. Um, and I would say, you know, I, when I did my first session with Dave, I immediately told Ellen, oh my God, that was a confronting session. And the, the, the problem is, even if you know, I beat you up that much. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it was like, just like my history, like, you know, it's like looking back and thinking, geez, man, why did it take me so long to work on this? But there was just, um, this is the thing. A lot of us sit, um, you know, I think a lot of people, especially people doing the spiritual work, we just so sort of have this love affair with the divine and we get our needs met in such a specific, unconditional way through the spiritual communities that actually risking, risking the pain again of online dating or whatever dating is, is like, it's not a pretty sight. And that's why Ellen and I feel really called to actually collaborate with you and to create something where we as a group can learn together. But definitely I would also say do the, do the individual work with Dave as well. You, you will benefit greatly. And Ellen, I know that. Yeah. I invite anyone here to like send me a friend request or, or reach out by email or whatever way feels right. Um, Y'all are my people. I said, I love working with people that are doing personal development. So my gift to you, I'm happy to, you know, have a conversation and, Kind of get to know you a little bit better so that i can give you even better quality answers because you know i can throw out an idea having just met you or i can get to know you a little bit better and give you a laser focused you know spot on answer so yeah. i'm happy to do that if it serves you if you're interested i'd love it yes you're such a love dave thank you <laughs> so amazing <laughs> We'll get back to you about your 24 week program. I just had a download. It should be like 48 weeks because, <laughs> because every week that you give us the content, there will be a big Q and A <laughs> the next week. <laughs> there needs to be some kind of integration because you just cannot like overload us with amazing content. I'll be like, oh, so much content, but also where do I go with the questions, you know? Well, that's, that's possible too. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I just, I think you probably could get a feel for just our conversation tonight. I really love this. Uh, I love what I'm, when I'm doing it and sharing it and I just appreciate it. So I have no problem with doing 48 weeks of talking with me. <laughs> and around. I think it should be for couples as well, because there's a lot of people that mm -hmm. here are, because I think um, there are beautiful men, husbands and wives that, and partners, you know, that want to do this work together. And I think um, just the single, the focus on singles, it's nice, but it's like, I think we can also learn from couples a yeah. lot, a lot, actually, a lot. Yeah. So, but yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, Ellen, what did you learn tonight? What did I learn tonight? I'm about to fall asleep. Uh, what did I learn? Uh, a lot, but um, I don't, I can't answer that question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very tired. No, it's, it's past the bedtime for, for Ellen. So, um, 
So I learned a lot, Dave. I mean, because you gave me, you gave us the five things, but just talking to you and really going through them, I had so many insights and sometimes I had pain in my heart listening to you because it was so confronting. It was so like in my face. Um, but definitely, you know, once we know this, we, we can work with it and we can like make changes. We don't have to stay unconscious and, uh, you know, not knowing what we're doing all the time. So, so, um, we are going to have more interviews with Dave, you know, and we always get downloads how we have to work with our guests. So thank you, everybody. Feel free to contact Dave. You know, I really highly recommend a package with him, but we're going to create this amazing, beautiful group coaching program with him. So uh, that will be our highest excitement, but definitely working individually with him. I would really recommend it as well. Yeah. Okay. And I'm happy just to connect. Even if you just want to connect, I guess. Yeah, I, just just have the conversation. personal development people. They're my people. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dave, for giving us so much of your time. Thank I will you. upload the video on YouTube and, and see how you, you can uh, spread it around. And uh, see if you can get that beautiful welcome in there and edit that together because it was really awesome. Thank you. I, I don't know how to edit it, but I have, re have recorded it. So I'll see how we can do it. You send that to me. I'll see if I can assemble them together. Amazing. Amazing. So thank you, everybody. Beautiful people. Uh, lots of love. Keep on believing. There's so much love out there. So many people looking for you. And, you know, and Dr. Joe always says it already happened because all potentials, all timelines exist now. So choose the timeline where your love is already with you, but you become that person that believes and takes the right action and makes the right adjustments as well. Thanks. Yes. Okay, Thank you, Dave. You're amazing. Bye, bye, everybody. Good night, bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. bye.